Let's start with uh, some good news, okay? The United Auto Workers announced it has struck a tentative deal with Ford, subject to approval by the 57,000 union members who work for Ford. Workers will get a 25% pay increase along with a cost of living adjustment each year. The new contract, along with pension and health adjustments, also addresses the divide between new workers and veteran employees. New workers will see their wages double over the next four years, and it is believed this agreement, if ratified, will pave the way for a settlement with GM and Stellantis, Stellantis being Chrysler. At least 22 people are dead and dozens wounded in two separate mass shootings late last night in Lewiston, Maine. One shooting took place inside a bowling alley, another inside a restaurant. Early reports say police now believe the shootings are connected to one suspect who used a high-powered assault weapon. Residents are being told to remain inside their homes, and police are looking for a 40-year-old white man with close-cropped hair who drove away in a small white SUV. There have been 565 mass shootings in America so far this year, which is why I say let's give all, all our weapons to Ukraine and Israel, all of them. President Biden on Wednesday became the first U.S. president in recent memory to to condemn right-wing extremist Jewish settlers attacking Palestinians living in the West Bank. I haven't heard a president talk this way in a long time. America's official policy is a two-state solution, with the West Bank serving as a Palestinian homeland, along with East Jerusalem and Gaza. During Benjamin Netanyahu, 16 years as prime minister, nearly 500,000 Jewish settlers have moved into the West Bank and East Jerusalem, and that is in direct violation of the Oslo Accords and in open defiance of America's official policy of a two-state solution. Settler attacks on Palestinian villages have increased since the October 7th slaughter that killed 1,400 innocent Israelis and took more than 200 innocent hostages. Human rights groups say the Jewish settlers in the West Bank have torched cars, shot and killed innocents, and forcibly removed hundreds of Palestinians from their homes since the Hamas massacre. President Biden yesterday called the Israelis committing these crimes, quote, extremist settlers. Biden said, quote, it has to stop. They have to be held accountable. It has to stop now. Well, if you want to hold them accountable, you got to do something about Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who opposes a two-state solution and has facilitated nearly half a million Jewish settlers moving into the West Bank and East Jerusalem, trying to make a two-state solution nearly impossible. Something has to be done about Bibi Netanyahu. The United Nations has convened an emergency session to bring about a ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war. So far, the member states of the United Nations Security Council are unable to agree on a resolution as the world body fails to include any wording that clarifies Israel's right to defend itself. The United States is one of the few holdouts not demanding a ceasefire, insisting Israel was attacked by Hamas and, like every other country in the world, Israel has every right to do whatever it takes to prevent future attacks. Brazil introduced a resolution that America and Israel rejected. It called for humanitarian aid to Gaza, condemning Hamas's attack of innocent Israelis, release of the hostages, 
and an immediate ceasefire. But Israel and America believe leaving Hamas intact means a ceasefire would only be temporary. America also rejected the resolution because of the wording. It didn't say Israel has the right to defend itself. For some reason, the entire world, except America and certain European countries, except for America and a couple of other countries, the rest of the world does not believe Israelis have a right to defend themselves. Now, if you want peace, as I do, and you want the killings to stop, my suggestion is to, when you make these resolutions, to include the words, Israel has the right to defend itself. I don't think you're going to get anywhere with the Israelis and many of the Jewish people. I happen to be Jewish. And after the Holocaust, uh, Jews need to hear th that you believe we have a right to defend ourselves. It's a non-starter if you don't believe Israel has a right to defend itself. No matter what humanitarian crisis is being created by Netanyahu in Gaza and the West Bank. Uh, whatever you believe, I want peace and I want it to stop. And you have every right to be outraged by what's going on in Gaza. I am. But if you want peace, you have to assure the Jews and the Israelis they have every right to defend themselves. Otherwise, it's going to be a, a non-starter. So uh, my suggestion is let go of those words and assure the Jewish people and the Israelis that, they, that you believe they have every right to defend themselves. And we have to get rid of Bibi Netanyahu. President Recep Erdogan of Turkey has traditionally served as a bridge between Hamas and the Israeli government. He's been back-channeling negotiations to release hostages, as well as getting humanitarian aid into Gaza. Erdogan has opened relations between Israel and Turkey, since they both have mutual interests trying to prevent the situation in Syria from spilling over the borders, which in Turkey's case it most certainly has. Straddling the West and the East, Turkey has been essential in keeping the lines open between America and Russia when it comes to the war in Ukraine. And he's been essential trying to tamp down the aggression between Hamas and Israel. If there's going to be a negotiation between Hamas and Israel, Erdogan would presumably play some role in this. But Erdogan also answers to his people. In an address before his parliament on Wednesday, he lashed out at Israel, calling its air assault on Gaza barbaric. Then, more problematic for Israel, he stated that Hamas is not a terrorist organization. He called it an organization of liberation, defending its people and its land. This is the mop-up for October 26, 2023. I'm David Feldman. Please like this episode. Share it, please, with your friends and family via email and social media. And please subscribe to my channel and my newsletter. A new report written by Democratic members of the Senate Finance Committee reveals Clarence Thomas borrowed $267,230 in 1999 to purchase a 40-foot luxury bus from Anthony Welters, a wealthy healthcare executive, who went on to forgive most, if not all, of this loan. The story was first reported by the New York Times months ago, and the Times said on Wednesday that Justice Thomas's failure to pay back most, if not all, of the loan has serious implications in terms of undeclared gifts and unpaid taxes. If Justice Thomas failed to report his friend's loan forgiveness to the government, he would owe taxes on it. 
The Times reports that the IRS classifies all debt forgiveness as income. Reporting in ProPublica this year revealed that over the years, Justice Thomas has accepted travel vacations worth close to a million dollars from one wealthy billionaire who has business before the court. Political business. Political business before the court. Senator Ron Wyden, who chairs the Senate Finance Committee, said he wants Thomas to explain the loan, but did not say whether he would force Thomas to testify because there's really no guarantee that Thomas would obey a subpoena and because contempt of Congress is eventually adjudicated by the Supreme Court, there's pretty much no way to enforce a subpoena. There's no way to make a Supreme Court justice testify. With no 2024 budget and weeks to go before a government shutdown, President Biden sent two emergency supplemental funding bills to the Capitol this week. Earlier in the week, he sent a $106 billion emergency funding bill to provide money for Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, border security, and humanitarian aid. This morning, he is sending something interesting to Congress. It's an emergency $56 billion domestic supplemental bill that would shore up FEMA's ability to respond to climate change-related disasters, was ExxonMobil-related disasters. And this is interesting. Billions for propping up America's floundering child daycare industry, something that was in Bernie's Build Back Better that got taken out, but not exactly what Biden's proposing. He wants to give $23 $23 billion for disaster relief, relief, and then $16 billion towards the child care sector. They're, so it's going to shore up the businesses that provide child care. There should not be businesses providing child care in America. There should be universal child care in America, and it shouldn't be privatized. It should be part of our public school system. Private daycare private, for-profit daycare, shortchanges the workers who earn starvation wages, and it shortchanges our children. Taking care of our children and taking care of the people who take care of our children should be exempt from the profit motive. But none of this even matters without a Speaker of the House, and unfortunately, we now have one. And no speaker is better than this speaker who leaves me speechless. Our new Republican speaker, Mike Johnson, blames Roe v. Wade on the budget shortfalls for Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. He says if Americans weren't killing so many able-bodied potential workers, our economy would have more than enough citizens paying into our social safety net. Listen to this cretin. Roe v. Wade gave constitutional cover to the elective killing of unborn children in America, period. You think about the implications of that on the economy. We're all struggling here to to cover the bases of Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and all the rest. If we had all those able-bodied workers in the economy, we wouldn't be going upside down and toppling over like this. Listen, the gentleman I yield. will not yield. I will not. Roe was a terrible corruption of America's constitutional jurisprudence. This is a nasty, nasty man. You know, Speaker Mike Johnson, if you're looking for able-bodied workers to jumpstart our economy and rescue Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, you could let women keep their bodily freedom and welcome all those able-bodied migrants down by the border. You could welcome them into America, many of whom are children, which you purport to care so much about. But let's be honest, those aren't the human lives you're looking to save, Speaker Johnson, right? No, you're only looking to save white Christian babies because the truth is you're not interested in saving Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. 
Underneath that Christian exterior is rank contempt for women, the LGBTQ community, people of color, and the unlucky. You're a nasty, nasty man. Leave it to the Republicans to find somebody worse than Jim Jordan. Mike Johnson is our new speaker. He's an ultra right wing homophobic bigot. Now, granted, people change, but because he's a Republican, this guy's more likely to change for the worse. I miss the good old days of paralysis and America's experiment in self-governance turning out to be a colossal failure. I miss the good old days when they couldn't elect a speaker. And I have a poll in our chat room right now, a live poll going. And you're, I have the question here. Uh, Mike Johnson's middle name is Tiny, No, Scabrous, or Manhungry. Please vote on what you think his middle name is. Is Mike Johnson's middle name Tiny, No, Manhungry, or Scabrous? And I'll have the results of this poll at the end of this episode. Wait, Mike Johnson gets a lot worse, a lot worse. He is a world-class 2020 election denier. According to the New York Times, in December of 2020, he rounded up 60% of House Republicans and got them to sign an amicus brief as part of that Texas lawsuit challenging Joe Biden's victory. The Supreme Court rejected it before January 6, but he was in on that. He gave multiple interviews, insisting the election was rigged while calling into question Dominion voting machines that he said, with absolutely no proof, came into America from Hugo Chavez's Venezuela with a virus intent on destroying our democracy. It's a crackpot from Louisiana. The Times reports that Johnson, who refused to certify the election for Joe Biden after January 6, still insists he and nearly two-thirds of the Republican caucus were right for objecting to the results on January 7th. They came in on January 7th after the insurrection, and they, they didn't certify. In 2020, Johnson served on Donald Trump's defense team during the former president's first impeachment. Remember the perfect phone call to Ukraine? That impeachment. And so it should come as no surprise that Donald Trump, who went out of his way to spike Tom Emmer's brief candidacy for speaker, called Johnson's nomination a great pick. Yep, Republicans came together to pick a hard right conservative Christian who opposes gender affirming care for minors, wants a national ban on abortion, outlaw same sex marriage, and casting her vote for Democrat Hakeem Jeffries, Congresswoman Angie Craig of Minnesota shouted in Mike Johnson's direction, happy wedding anniversary to my wife, Hakeem Jeffries. Now, Hakeem Jeffries isn't her wife, but she was calling out to her wife, and then she voted for Hakeem Jeffries. Jim McGovern, Democrat from Massachusetts, said of Johnson, He's the same extremist menu, just a new waiter. Same old extremist menu, new waiter. So what does this mean? Well, heading into the 2024 elections, Democrats in the House hope to position this election as a referendum on abortion, an issue that makes Republicans very vulnerable in purple districts. While Johnson was able to unify the Republican caucus, thanks to his being a principled conservative whose purity on cultural issues is beyond repute, he's also been able to unify Democrats who are more than willing to make the electoral fight for control of Congress centered primarily around the culture wars. So as usual, 2024 is gonna be a win-win for Washington and a lose-lose for America. The Democrats get what they want, the Republicans get what they want, and we get absolutely 
nothing. Johnson is a lawyer and one of the leading voices of the odious, disgusting, and repulsive Alliance Defending Freedom, which funds, among other things, lawsuits challenging same-sex marriage. Andrew Kaczynski over at CNN's K-File uncovered op-ed pieces that Johnson penned in the early 2000s, where he called for the, I wish I were making this up, criminalization of homosexuality. He warned it's an unnatural act that serves as a gateway to pedophilia. He's a hick from Louisiana with a law degree. A constitutional scholar in 2005, Johnson warned that homosexuality is a threat to democracy, and if allowed and permitted, homosexuality will result in complete chaos and utter anarchy. Chaos and utter anarchy, which proves exactly what marked out the out-of-control Republican caucus this year. You're all a bunch of queers. That's what Marjorie Taylor Greene said about them. So she's, she's right. The speaker says homosexuality causes chaos and anarchy. Marjorie Taylor Greene was right when she called her caucus a bunch of queers. <laughs> she's something else. Well, Republicans, you got to hand it to them. They found somebody worse than Jordan, and they defied expectations by nominating and then electing Mike Johnson of Louisiana, Speaker of the House, all in basically 24 hours. Steve Scalise, who's also from Louisiana, will remain as House Majority Leader after his bid for Speaker never even made it to the floor for a vote due to Jim Jordan's backstabbing. Johnson won nearly a unanimous vote from Republicans, but we're hearing reports that the old speaker, Kevin McCarthy, tried to squash his chances at the last minute. Florida Republican Matt Gates is now saying that after Johnson got the nomination, former Speaker McCarthy was still holding out hope that Johnson would fail to get 217 votes. And with the caucus in chaos, they would finally realize ousting Kevin McCarthy was a mistake and decide he was the only one I ever needed all along. You'll see. You'll, you'll go out with all the other nominees, but eventually you'll come back to Kevin. No, no. Gates said he smoked McCarthy out before the vote and Republicans were able to pry a Johnson endorsement out of Kevin McCarthy's rapacious hands. Kevin McCarthy eventually endorsed Johnson and voted for him. And uh, Johnson has been good to McCarthy. He voted to keep him a speaker in October, on October 3rd. Uh, but McCarthy wasn't willing, had to be pushed into returning the uh, favor. Johnson won with 220 votes, five more than he needed. The threshold had been lowered from 217 to 215 due to two congressional absences. He kept his promise by making his first act as Speaker, passing a resolution showing support for Israel and condemning Hamas for the October 7th massacre. Ten members of Congress, nine Democrats and one Republican, voted against the resolution. The uh, ten members of Congress uh, voting against the resolution uh, were Democrats Jamal Fire Alarm Bowman from New York, Andre Carson of Indiana, Cory Bush of Missouri, Al Green of Texas, Summer Lee of Pennsylvania, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of New York, Ilan Omar of Minnesota, Delia Ramirez of Illinois and Rashida Tlaib of Michigan. Republican Congressman Thomas Massey also voted against it. Six Democrats voted present. Greg Kassir, Joaquin Castro, Nidia Velasquez, Ayanna Presley, Chu Garcia, and Pramila Jayapal. The government's fiscal year began on October 1st, and there's still no budget for 2024. 
the continuing resolution to keep the government running expires in exactly 23 days. Budget hardliners who oppose the continuing resolution, Speaker Johnson was not one of them, budget hardliners who oppose the continuing resolution are indicating a willingness to give Johnson more time to get the lay of the land by extending the continuing resolution into January of 2024. Matt Gates said he was assured that Johnson, unlike McCarthy, is committed to what are called single subject bills when it comes to budget appropriations. This way, Congress can give a thumbs up or a thumbs down on the funding for individual specific agencies as opposed to bundling their appropriations into a massive bill like lumping Ukraine and Israel and Taiwan and border security into one bill. He wants single subject bills. The consensus as of this morning is that Speaker Johnson is liked by the Republican caucus. And unlike former Speaker McCarthy, Republicans in the House are rooting for him to succeed. I don't think Kevin McCarthy realized how hated he is. Republican Nancy Mace of South Carolina despises Kevin McCarthy and was one of the crazy eight who voted for him to vacate the chair. She's repeatedly called him dishonest. And after Speaker Johnson won, she told reporters, quote, the disgraced former speaker tried to look like a team player publicly while behind the scenes he was blocking each person who ascended. The former speaker still can't see this dishonesty and these games are why the American people wanted to remove him. He was working behind the scenes, causing chaos so he'd eventually be voted back into office. It didn't work. He's a bad guy, as bad as Speaker Johnson. Speaker Johnson, <laughs> what a st stupid name for a stupid hick from Louisiana. Racist, bigot, just dumb, bad, nasty, mean guy, mean, hateful. I've watched him in the committee rooms. He's a nasty, nasty man, pompous, arrogant, self-serving, self-righteous. In the end, much of the chaos within the caucus that we witnessed this past couple of weeks had less to do with policy and more to do with petty grievances, jealousy, slights, and personalities. In many ways, Johnson comes to this with the advantage of being an unknown fixture, with each member of the caucus attaching to him their unfulfilled hopes and wishes dashed by Kevin McCarthy. McCarthy, like I said, everyone agreed, was a liar who could not be trusted. The hope is that Republicans won't agree with him on everything, but he can be trusted to be a nasty, vindictive little prick. Republicans will also benefit from Johnson being a newbie as far as the, as far as the American voters are concerned, and that would make 2024 less of a referendum on him. Uh, when you're voting for c Congress, members of Congress, it's often a referendum on the speaker, and that's not good for the ruling party's uh, candidates in purple districts. They don't want it to be a referendum on Nancy Pelosi or whoever the speaker is. So had McCarthy remained as speaker or Jordan won the speakership, Republicans would be more likely to lose seats next November since both those guys were known quantities and they were disliked, uh, especially in the nearly 20 Republican-held districts that Joe Biden carried in 2020. Those are the tough purple districts that, like Mike Lawler in upstate New York, are not expected to hold on to. So Johnson flying under the radar makes it less likely for House Republicans to draw flack. And that's good for the Republicans. You're listening to The David Feldman Show. This is The Mop-Up. 
for October 26, 2023. Please share this episode with your friends and family via social media and email and subscribe to my channel as well as my newsletter. Hit the like button and uh, I have a quick correction, but before I get to it, we're doing a, a live poll in our chat room here on YouTube. And this is the question. I'll read the results at the end of this episode. Mike Johnson's middle name is Tiny, No, Man Hungry, or Scabrous. Mike Johnson's middle name is Tiny or No? Is it Man Hungry or is it Scabrous? Please vote in the chat room and I'll have these important election results at the end of this episode. I also have a correction. Republican whip Tom Emmer is from the crappy state of Minnesota. I said on yesterday's program he was from the crappy state of Wisconsin, and I was wrong, but not as wrong as the people who decided to live in Wisconsin, Minnesota, as well as Oklahoma. I know Oklahoma has nothing to do with this, but F Oklahoma too. Also, Tom Emmer's middle name isn't Butt Breath. That's his nickname, not his middle name. My sincerest apologies to Tom Butt Breath Emmer, House Whip. Well, Republican Whip. New York Democratic Congressman Jamal Bowman will plead guilty to setting off a fire alarm inside the Capitol on September 30th while Congress was debating a last-minute continuing resolution to keep the government operating until November 17th. Capitol Police say they investigated and are going to charge him with the crime. So I guess I called Congressman Bowman. I came up with a defense for pulling the fire alarm. Stag Laredo chili with its fiery blend of jalapenos and deep red peppers. That was my defense. Just say, I dare any one of you to light your mouth on fire with this red hot concoction of beef beans and zesty spices and not want to pull on the red alarm pleading for a fire hose to put you out. That was my unsolicited defense, but he didn't go for it. Congressman Bowman agreed to pay a $1,000 fine and write an apology to Capitol Police. Bowman activated the fire alarm while Democrats were complaining that then-Speaker McCarthy had put before them a 70-page bill that they had no time to read. Some have suggested that Bowman, Congressman Bowman, might have pulled the alarm to buy Democrats more time to read the bill. Democrats did read the bill and voted to pass it. At the time, Bowman said he thought he was pressing a button to open a door. But in Wednesday's statement, where he accepted full responsibility, the congressman said, quote, I am responsible for activating a fire alarm. I will be paying the fine issued and look forward to these charges being ultimately dropped. Well, yes, I'm drinking water. People don't like my gulping sounds. Let's go to Donald Trump's D.C. election interference trial. The ACLU filed an amicus brief in support of Donald Trump's lawyers who are attempting to lift a gag order imposed against the former president in his Washington, D.C. election interference trial. If you remember, Tanya Chutkin, the presiding judge in that case, issued a narrowly tailored gag order. That's what they're calling it, a narrowly tailored gag order. Would it come from Italy? It's narrowly tailored. Uh, it's a narrowly tailored gag order. Uh, and then she froze it, awaiting appeal by Trump's lawyers. This is kind of interesting. If you read between the lines, you find things out. Special counsel Jack Smith requested the order, complaining that Trump's comments bordered on witness tampering, as well as endangering the lives of Justice Department officials and contaminating potential jurors in Washington, D.C. Late Wednesday night, Special Counsel Smith filed a motion saying that Trump's comments Tuesday about his former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, flipping 
cooperating with the special counsel's office were menacing and intimidating and served all the more reason to reinstate the gag order. Now, this is interesting because ABC News on Tuesday reported that Meadows made a plea deal with special counsel Smith's office, but Smith's office refused to confirm it. But judging by the language in Wednesday's gag order motion, it, I think it's now safe to say that Meadows has indeed become a cooperating witness for the special counsel. He, he's flipped. He flipped. It's official. Anthony Romero, executive director of the ACLU, said the judge's gag order was too vague and might make it impossible for Trump to wage his campaign for president. Romero said it was Trump's words that got him indicted, but he is still entitled to his First Amendment rights awaiting trial. He was saying, basically, you can indict somebody for the words they use. Certain words are not protected by the First Amendment. But he's worried that his free speech is being denied by this gag order. Romero added, quote, No modern-day president did more damage to civil liberties and civil rights than President Trump. But if we allow his free speech rights to be abridged, we know that other unpopular voices, even ones we agree with, will also be silenced. Judge Chutkin's gag order, like I said, is now frozen while she listens to these arguments. Her gag order allowed Trump to attack her, President Biden, as well as other candidates for the Republican nomination, so long as the attacks pertain to policy. Like Mike Pence is going to be a witness in this case. So Trump, she said, is allowed to attack Mike Pence's positions as a candidate for president, but he's not allowed to attack him for testifying in this trial. He is also allowed to insist on his innocence and say that his prosecution is politically motivated. A narrowly tailored gag order from Italy. Judge Chutkin's narrowly tailored gag order forbids Trump from targeting any witnesses in this case or discussing the substance of their testimony. So enforcing gag orders are a little dicey. It's not that easy. Some legal scholars say a judge can't rule unilaterally that Trump is guilty of contempt of court, violating my gag order, and then throwing him straight into jail. Turns out such a move requires a separate prosecution, another judge, another trial, and that's time intensive. Let's go to New York, where Donald Trump's fraud trial is now in its fourth week. Donald Trump was fined $10,000 on Wednesday for violating a gag order imposed by the judge in his New York civil fraud trial. This is the second fine leveled against Trump by the judge. The previous fine was $5,000. While issuing the fine, Judge Arthur Engeron turned to Trump and warned, don't do it again or it will be worse. Trump had been warned not to disparage any of the employees of this court. Trump was fined last week for accusing the judge's clerk of carrying on an affair with Senator Chuck Schumer. That cost Trump $5,000. If you listened to yesterday's show, I said Trump was violating the gag order uh, on the campaign trail. He was trashing the judge. What got him in trouble this time was he could not control himself. And on Wednesday, rattled by his former fixer, Michael Cohn's incredibly damaging testimony on Tuesday, Trump stood before a bank of microphones on Wednesday and accused the judge's clerk of being biased. This is what he said. This is what got him the $10,000 fine. Quote, this judge is a very partisan judge with a person who's very partisan sitting alongside of him, perhaps even more partisan than he is. And that cost him 10 grand. It was interesting. The judge brought Trump uh, up and made him 
sit on the witness stand and then grilled him. He said, did you make these comments? And Trump said, yes, I did. But Trump insisted the remarks were directed at Michael Cohen, not the clerk. Judge Engeron said, I don't believe you. $10,000, knock it off or it's going to get worse. Well, there were some fireworks on uh, Wednesday. Michael Cohen, if you remember, testified on Tuesday that he was ordered by Donald Trump to alter financial statements to make his boss look richer than he actually was. But during cross-examination on Wednesday, Trump's lawyers quoted Michael Cohen's 2019 testimony before the House Oversight Committee, which contradicted his testimony on Tuesday. In 2019, Cohen was asked by the House Oversight Committee, quote, did Mr. Trump direct you or Mr. Weisselberg to inflate the numbers for his personal statement? And Michael Cohen responded, quote, did he ask me to inflate the numbers? Not that I recall. So read back to him in court on Wednesday, Cohen said he lied under oath when he said that to the House Oversight Committee. Okay. The trial resumed after lunch, and Michael Cohn retook the stand and was asked again by Trump's lawyers about his 2019 testimony before the House Oversight Committee, where he claimed he was never asked to inflate Trump's wealth. He said he lied. Before lunch, he said he had lied to the House Oversight Committee, but this time Cohen changed his answer and insisted his testimony before the House Oversight Committee was truthful, that he wasn't lying. Why? Why do you think he said that? Because during lunch, his lawyer said, you just confessed to committing perjury before the House Oversight Committee. So he took it back. Trump's lawyers immediately said, it's over, the case is over. And they demanded the judge dismiss the case. The judge uh, and Trump's attorneys and the prosecutors conferred. And while they were talking, Trump bolted out of the courtroom. His Secret Service agents didn't know where he was running to. And then he stood before the reporters and proclaimed, quote, the witness just admitted that we won the trial and the judge should end this trial immediately. Meanwhile, back in the courtroom, Judge Engeron said Michael Cohen's conflicting testimony wasn't grounds for throwing the trial out. But Trump's attorneys argued the government's star witness just, quote, fell flat on his face. Judge Engeron said there were mountains of evidence against Trump that could fill his courtroom and disputed the idea that Michael Cohen was the government's star witness. There are no stars in my courtroom. It's more of an ensemble with some breakout players, but we're part of the same team here. He didn't say that. But there's no such thing as a star witness. During the government's re-examination of their ensemble witness, Michael Cohn, he was asked how he reconciled the 2019 testimony before the House Oversight Committee, where he said Trump didn't ask him to inflate numbers, and Tuesday's testimony, where he said Trump did ask him to inflate numbers. Cohn explained that Donald Trump, quote, speaks like a mob boss. He tells you what he wants without specifically telling you. We understood what he wanted, unquote. Plus, I don't want to go to prison for perjuring myself before Congress. He didn't say that, but that's the game he's playing. After court was adjourned for the day, Cohen stood before reporters and said of Trump, I saw a defeated man I saw somebody that knows that it's the end of the Trump organization. Donald Trump told reporters that his attorneys just had their Perry Mason moment by catching Cohen's contradictory statements. Their Perry Mason moment. 
And he, then he said Trump insisted that any other judge would throw the case out right now. Then he added, by Perry Mason, I mean the HBO series starring Matthew Reese, not the Perry Mason series on CBS starring Raymond Burr, which most of you are too young to remember. I don't know why he had to clarify that. He didn't say that. New York State Attorney General Letitia James, who brought the case against Trump, reiterated what Judge Egeron said earlier and tell reporters Michael Cohen is not her star witness and there is enough evidence against Trump to fill the entire courtroom. The trial continues until December with Trump expected to take the stand when there will be enough horseshit to fill the entire courtroom. Let's go to Colorado where Donald Trump is being sued to keep his name off that state's primary ballot. Citizens for Ethics is behind the lawsuit attempting to scrape Donald Trump's name off the Colorado presidential primary ballot, citing the insurrection clause of the 14th Amendment. On Wednesday, they announced that the judge in this case rejected a final motion from Trump's lawyers to dismiss the case, which now means there's another trial for Donald Trump. It's scheduled to start this Monday. Petitioners plan to prove Donald Trump disqualified himself from holding office when he staged the January 6th insurrection, and they plan to make him testify under oath. A similar case is also wending its way through Minnesota's courts. A lot of lawsuits coming up. Let's go down to Georgia, where Donald Trump is on trial for election interference. Sidney Powell, one of the co-defendants in the Georgia election interference RICO trial, is still spreading lies about the 2020 election, despite striking a plea deal last week with the Fulton County, Georgia's DA. Powell, if you remember, pled guilty to six misdemeanor counts of conspiracy to commit election interference in exchange for her testimony against the other 18 defendants, including Donald Trump. She also agreed to write a letter of apology to the people of Georgia, but we are now learning her letter of apology consisted of just one sentence. Sounds to me like Fawny Willis is about to give her a longer sentence. Business Insider reported on Wednesday that Sidney Powell's social media accounts continue to push lies that Joe Biden stole the 2020 presidential election. Defending the Republic is the nonprofit she founded to raise money for, quote unquote, election integrity research. Her newsletter from Defending the Republic uh, over the weekend said that her guilty plea was the result of political extortion. All these people are bad. They're all liars, and they have a very tenuous relationship with the truth, including, unfortunately, Michael Cohen. He's brave, but he's got his own issues. Business Insider also reported that Sidney Powell continues to post to Twitter false claims of voter fraud in Georgia and has posted links promoting the work of other election deniers like Dinesh D'Souza, whose latest documentary purports that America's police are cooperating with Joe Biden to keep him in office past 2024. CNN reported on Wednesday that Fawny Willis, the Fulton County District Attorney, is confident that six more co-defendants in her RICO trial are about to flip. Will it be Rudy? Making the number of cooperating, cooperating witnesses 10. Mark Meadows, Trump's former chief of staff, is one of those 19 co-defendants. And as I mentioned earlier, he, he flipped in the D.C. case. Will he flip in Georgia? And Rudy Giuliani found a lawyer dumb enough to represent him down in Georgia. He was having trouble finding a lawyer stupid enough to take him on in Georgia. Rudy 
reportedly owes more than $4 million in unpaid legal fees. $4 million in unpaid legal fees. But Alan Stockton of Stockton and Stockton told the court he would be representing Rudy. Sounds like Stockton and Stockton has a Stockton who barely passed the bar and is willing to work for free. You've heard of pro bono? Well, this kid is doing it pro am bono, and he's the am as an amateur. Can't be good for Rudy. Anything you'd like to add, Rudy, to this? I like scotch. Yes, you do. Are you worried about what's going to happen in Georgia? Are you going to flip? I drink scotch. Yes, you do. And Donald Trump, anything you'd like to ask, add? Stormy Horseface Daniels. My girlfriend, uh, who lives uh, with me, is very depressed. She's catatonic because she lives with me. And I, I just want to bring her on the show briefly and, and tell her the show's over. Yay. Okay. Did you take your, your medicine? Because if you, if you took your medicine... Your, your happy medicine, I'll crawl into bed with you. Wouldn't that be nice? Yay. Okay. Uh, I love you. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Yay. Oh, you don't love me. Well, if, if you don't love me, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move out. Yay. Okay. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Thank you for listening to this nonsense. Please like this show. Please subscribe to my channel and my newsletter. Please share this with everybody. Thank you to all the moderators, to Bob in the chat room. I don't know if he's here. It's really late. And thank you for showing up. We started late. Let's go to the poll and see the results of my poll. Because uh, we're polling about uh, Mike Johnson's poll, as, as a nonsense. matter of fact. The question is, Mike Johnson's middle name is, and these are your, uh, your choices. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mike Johnson's middle name is Tiny, Scabrous, No, or Man Hungry. Uh, no, Mike No Johnson got 15%. <coughs> That's fourth and fourth place. Coming in third is Man Hungry, <coughs> Mike Man Hungry Johnson. Uh, coming in second place with 31% is Scabrous, Mike Scabrous Johnson. And uh, coming in first place was 36%, a plurality, Mike Tiny Johnson. Interesting, fascinating. Real, this is how I keep a pulse on the electorate. It's very important that I do this. Okay, thank you, everybody. I'm going to start earlier tomorrow. Thank you.